So welcome everybody to OLS5. This is our second welcome call. We had one last week and we had such a pleasure meeting a lot of people and uh, hopefully you can watch their video, which is already on YouTube. Um, because we're all in different time zones, it's, it's probably true that you would not meet everybody, but we hope you still get to interact with them on Slack and YouTube. Um, we have a roll call. Please add your name, tell us which project you're joining with. Give an emoji mood for today if you have an emoji lying around somewhere. And share a song that you're listening to uh, endlessly or something that expresses your mood. If you're in London, it's quite gray. So maybe you want to put something sad and gloomy, or maybe you enjoy rain. Uh, we have a code of conduct that actually that, that applies to this call. So at any point, if you feel that something makes you uncomfortable, you have any concern or any suggestion on accessibility, please let us know by emailing team at openlifesite.org. But you can also email individually to Yo, Emmy, Bernice, or me if you have some, something specific to talk about that you don't want to tell to the whole cohort. This call has a live transcription that you can click on the top left of your screen, but you can also find the link to that in the line number 84. Um, so there is a breakout room. There will be lots of breakout room. And that's one of the things that people really, really enjoy um, in the, these cohort calls, because a lot of time it's just us or our speakers talking and you would be awkwardly listening to us. But of course you have quite a lot to share with each other. So we'll send you to breakout rooms. But we have two kinds of breakout room. One is written and another is spoken. So to indicate which breakout room you want to go, I would ask you to take a minute or actually 10 seconds to edit your name. And that you can do by clicking on three dots on the top right of your screen. And when you click on that, please add S for spoken in front of your name. So I'm actually adding S in front of my name or W for written, as you can see, Emmy has uh, used W in front of it. The reason to add it in the beginning is that it allows us to uh, sort quite easily because all the alphabetically S will appear on the top and W at the bottom. Another reason also to have the written format is that a lot of people actually feel more comfortable interacting via chat or in the written form. And if you are one of those, you can use the Zoom chat to interact or you can use Etherpad, uh, which where we will allocate different rooms for different node spaces. You don't need to share anything that you do not want to share. Uh, if you want to share anything personal, you can anonymize any information. Um, but again, it's really for you to use it in the way that's useful for you. You can also use uh, spoken, of course, but let, let people know if you come into the room, if you would ask them to speak a bit slowly, more clearly, or there are some words that are not clear. I still do not know all the vocabulary of English and I still don't know many, many words. So please don't uh, hesitate to ask for a bit of more clarification. And I think that's a bit of my spiel of things that you would almost hear in every call. I'm just going to ask you or Amy to uh, unmute and let me know if I miss something that I should mention. All good? Great. Awesome. So now this is the lightning round where we want to take time to learn about each other. But we're going to do it very quickly because we have lots to get through today. Uh, but we will do your name, where you're joining from, what your project is, and what's your most recent hobby. Um, and I will actually follow the roll call that you've added your name. So I'm going to start with Yo. Hey folks, I'm Yo. I'm in the UK near Cambridge. Uh, my project is OLS um, because I'm, it's actually my paid job. And my most recent hobby, I'm going to say running. I went running this morning. Nice. Ishmael. Hi, my name is Ismail. I'm working on an incomplete history of research ethics. Um, I'm in, I'm somewhere close to London, Southeast London. Um, and my most recent hobby was uh, writing on Wikipedia. And I imagine that will be my hobby for a while now. Um, so. Amazing. Uh, tell Ishmael if you want to make your Wikipedia page then. 
So it's next week. Next is me. I am Malvika. I am joining from London. My project is OLS, but also the Turing way that you will also hear quite a lot. Um, my recent hobby is uh, acrylic painting, and I'm saying hobby, but I've just done one, so I'm not sure how long that lasts. Next is Vicky. Hi, uh, I'm Vicky. Uh, I'm also joining from London. Uh, my project is the Turing Roche project, which is an academic industry partnership. Um, and my most recent hobby, me and my friend went to a pool hall yesterday to play some pool. And there was about 50 old men in there and I was the only woman. So I feel like that's my new, new space. <laughs> Great state of mind, Aisha. Everyone, I'm Aisha. Um, I'm also joining from London. Um, my project is the Data Science and AI Educators Programme, um, which is fairly new. And this is more of a sort of long standing hobby, but I really love like competitive cycling. Amazing. Georgia. Hi, everyone. I'm Georgia. I'm working on accessible autism resources in South Africa with Rob for OLS5, which is really exciting, um, based in London. I'm trying to think of like a recent hobby. Um, I've been making clothes actually with one of my friends. So sewing, I guess. But like you, Mami, it's a very new thing. Like I've only made one thing, so I don't know if it counts as a hobby yet. Let's ask each other in a moment, Georgia. Emmy. Hi, I'm Emmy. Um, located currently in Utrecht, the Netherlands. Um, my project is OLS, but I also work for Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, and recent hobby, bouldering. Love it. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah M. I think we only oh. have on Sarah today. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's usually more than one. Uh, I'm Sarah Niantowski. I am also based in London. Um, my project is um, co-creating an online learning platform for the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, and my current hobby, I do it briefly every year. I've been following the Six Nations rugby tournament. I'm an Italy supporter and watching them lose every single match. So it's hard going. But rooting for the underdogs, why not? One of these days. <laughs> and... Hi everyone, uh, I'm Anne. Uh, I'm the new community manager for the Turing Way uh, starting Monday, so I'm very new on the job. Uh, I'm calling in from Bristol, uh, possibly making the move to London soon, if anyone wants to help me make a major life decision. Um, and I'm on the governance project with Malvika. Welcome Anne. I just want to tell you all, we do have a Turing heavy call today. But uh, it, it's an it's an important point for us to let them know who you all are outside the Turing too. Um, Bridget. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Bridget Nee. I am in London as well. I'm at the Turing Institute. Um, I'm working on a kind of Turing Way adaptive peer mentoring training program with Andrea, who is on the call today. Um, and my recent hobby is that I have bought a piano again to retrain myself. I've played for years. I've completely forgotten. So, um, yeah. Amazing. Uh, Gabby. Hi, I am Gabby. I am from Argentina. Uh, I am from the Open Fighter Leads Project with Emma, Zach, well, and Celine, a lot of people. And my recent hobby is to be a mother. I have a baby girl, so I don't have a hobby. I have a baby. <laughs> Thank God you said it, because Bernie said that for the last call, and it is an important heavy, um, hobby. Thank you so much. Gemma. Hi, everyone. I'm Gemma. I'm calling in from Barcelona, Spain. And my project is the Resilio Open Source Initiative, which is a small nonprofit organization from the UK. And my hobby uh, is circus. I'm a circus artist. So I don't know if hobby or job, but somewhere in between. Wow, that's amazing. Lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Gareth. Hi, everyone. I'm Gareth. Um, I'm at the University of Bristol. Um, but I'm currently in Prague. Um, I work on the Open GHG project, which is 
um, processing and analyzing greenhouse gas data. We make like dashboards and things for yeah, outreach and that type of thing. Um, my current hobby is attempting very bad, well, well, attempting to learn Chinese, but I'm, yeah, very much a beginner. You definitely know more than most of us in this call, unless someone didn't tell us. Luke. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Luke, and I am um, calling from London as well. I'm based at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, apologies, I can't figure out how to get my video to work uh, this morning for some reason. Um, but I am working on the Hub 23 project, which is uh, a project that the, um, the Research Engineering Group and the Turing Institute are, are running, um, building and maintaining the um, Turing Institute's internal Binder Hub deployment. Um, for those of you who don't know Binder Hub, I'm sure you'll find out from me in the next whatever, 10 or 12 weeks. Um, and my recent hobby, um, I, I also bought a piano recently, but unlike Bridget, I have never played it in my life. So I'm going to see how that goes. I have a piano next to me and I'm like, oh, I should connect with all these people and learn as well. Thanks so much, Luke. Adersh. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Adersh. Uh, I'm uh, located in Delft, the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm working on uh, data-driven catalyst discovery. And uh, my most recent hobby, I think we recently picked up playing dodgeball with a group of friends. Amazing. We have another one, Evelyn, but I think Evelyn is sick. She had to drop. Uh, so we're gonna just move on to the next part and I'll hand it to you for that. Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna do the screen sharey thing. Let's get this working. Okay, share screen, Firefox. Do y'all see my slides? Okay, and do they advance when I advance? Even better, this is amazing. Okay. Hey folks, short presentation, just going to do um, introduction to OLS here. Um, if you see me looking at away from the camera, it's because I have a second screen over here. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. Um, so welcome to OLS 5, we're delighted to have you here. Um, so there are four OLS uh, organizers. Um, three of us are here today. So there's Bernice Matu, um, who isn't on the call at the moment. Uh, she, she has a sick little kid at the moment. Um, and then there's myself, Yo Yehudi, uh, Malvika Sharan, who's been doing the bulk of the hosting so far, and Emmy, who will pick up some hosting in a bit. Um, and we believe that to be effective, science should be shared openly with others and made freely available. I'll even expand that and say not just science, but any other type of research, even if it doesn't fall into a STEM field as well. Um, but it's not just the four of us, it's a lot more than the four of us. And actually, it's a lot more than the 302 here, because um, once we update this with the OLS five numbers, there's 375 people who have participated in OLS as mentors, as expert speakers, um, as project leaders, and very often people will occupy more than one of those roles. So people who may have been in the past um, a project leader, then may become an expert or a mentor. Um, and we have another role where people who help, help facilitate calls um, and transcribe and upload the recordings to YouTube is another really important contribution. Um, so we have a lot of people in the community um, and they're the people who make everything go. Um, yeah, and we're delighted to add you to our number. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Next slide, come on, we can do it. Okay, so um, what OLS is, you probably have a pretty good idea if you are here um, and you have made it to week three. Um, but just as a reminder, we help individuals and groups become open science and open research ambassadors. Um, so that means that whilst you're probably applied, uh, applied to work on a specific project, very often people find that they learn open research related skills that they can then share with other people, uh, share you know, in, on other projects uh, and, and their day to day work as well, not just on the project that you're working on. Um, hence the ambassador term. Um, and science really can only advance when we share our work with others. If we don't share it, people are just going to end up, as we say, reinventing the wheel, doing the same thing over and over again because you don't know that anyone else has done it, or maybe you know it's been done, but you don't have enough information to actually do it again on your own without that, without, um, yeah, 
without, without it having been shared. Um, so people are often afraid that they may be scooped, that they may be criticized if they share their work, um, which, raise, which raises the question, how can I work openly without being scientifically vulnerable? And the goal of OLS is to try and talk about this, to talk about the benefits, the reasons that it's important and what you gain from sharing your work and collaborating with others rather than working competitively. So we'll explore some of the important practices around this and we'll apply them to our work one step at a time. Um, so this is why we have the alternating where one week we have a cohort call and then one week we have the mentor calls. Um, and so we, we, we have often just 10, 15 minute talks about a specific topic. Um, as well as the breakout rooms, which you'll experience throughout the cohort course. Um, and then every other meeting, you have a meeting with your mentor, um, and that helps apply some of these concepts to your projects. And because it's over a longer period of time, it really helps embed in. Um, I feel like I said this slide before it came up, <laughs> talking about the alternating between mentors um, and the cohort training. Uh, 16 weeks, we're on week three. Um, and one thing you'll see reference to quite a lot is Mozilla's open leadership framework. Um, so OLS was born from a previous program uh, called Mozilla Open Leaders, which wasn't research or science specific, but did teach people how to collaborate online very effectively. Uh, so there'll be a lot of times when we refer to the framework or when we refer you to Mozilla resources, uh, you may occasionally see a Mozilla logo or Mozilla fonts here and there as well, because um, a lot of the materials that we, we started with were Mozilla materials. Um, so open leaders um, design, build and empower their projects and communities to understand, share, participate and be inclusive. We will show this sentence a lot at different times, but we'll be highlighting different aspects of it in each cohort call as we go along. Um, and here's a preview of what's called the Mozilla Open Leadership Framework. Um, so um, this sort of en encompasses the sentence that we mentioned earlier with people understanding, sharing and, win and having participation and inclusion, as well as designing, building and empowering for them. So we'll sort of cover different squares within this table from time to time as we work through the um, various bits of the curriculum. So some of the things that open science can mean. Um, I will try not to read fully through this list, but instead just to sort of elaborate on some of it. So sharing data is one that's, I think, perhaps commonly understood as open science, as would be open access, I think. Um, but we talk about other things as well, like sharing the source code if you write code, not everyone does, um, but sharing the source code for your research. If you have hardware designs, it's um, important to share those with other people as well, and it often means that tooling can be much more affordable if you share your open hardware. Uh, Preprints allow you to share your results early. I think they've gained a lot of um, eyeballs since the pandemic compared to perhaps what, what they may have been before that. Um, sharing reviews is another aspect of open science. Um, open education. Um, citizen science is one that I particularly like. Uh, another phrase that you often hear is participatory science. Um, and networking. We try very hard to build a very good network within OLS as well. So those are some of the topics we cover. It's definitely not everything. Um, but we will also talk about open by design a lot as a concept that's very, very important to us. And what that means um, is uh, basically that you should intentionally design your projects to be open rather than let that be a default. Um, so in 2012, this is actually 10 years old, I feel like there must be some newer study that we can begin to cite here, it's just the slides slowly been aging away from us. Um, but yeah, in 2012, there was a study of 106, uh, 160 tech companies which found that strategic intent in openness correlates with market performance. Um, and you may have heard the phrase like, if you build it, they will come. And I think the idea is actually maybe that's not true, that you have to be conscious and thoughtful and design it if you want people to come and to have pathways that people will be able to then venture inwards and join your projects. Um, so design openness into your work and don't just let it be a default is a lot of what we try and cover here. Um, so with our visions together, we are all going to be trying to achieve positive change in our communities. Uh, I think this is the last slide. Um, I was like remote high five here or something and get really excited, but that doesn't really work. So I will stop sharing. That is just a kind of brief overview of, have I stopped sharing? I have. Cool. Okay. 
Um, yeah, just that's a very quick brief overview of sort of some of the things that we cover in OLS. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point? I appreciate the really obvious head shakes, by the way. It's, it's really nice to know that I'm not just alone. <laughs> um, so if there are any questions, um, there's mostly been head shakes, but you can always type them in the Zoom chat. We'll try and pay attention to that. Um, or alternatively, in the Etherpad, you can type as well. Right now, it's line 99, which is a good number. Um, I'll give it a moment more. OK, right. I will just assume that I was super, super clear. Thanks all. <laughs> Right, so um, we're going to go into a breakout room and give everyone the chance to meet uh, some of the cohort um, in either the spoken or the written rooms. Um, so uh, this is our first breakout room. Uh, so you may have been in breakout rooms before, just run through some quick reminders. So um, like Malvika mentioned earlier, we have the option of either written rooms or spoken rooms. Choose which one you like, either is fine. Um, but do try and pay attention to that. Um, if you're if you're in a written room, make sure that you are writing as a general rule. Um, so when you are in a written room, you can either use the Zoom chat or you can use the Etherpad to take notes. Either is fine because when you're in the Zoom chat in a breakout room, it doesn't broadcast to the rest of the group. So you aren't actually accidentally shouting your conversation to the world. Don't worry. Um, if you get stuck for any reason, there is on the bottom of Zoom, there will be an option to ask for help. Um, and that will allow me or one of the other organizers to just teleport into your room and chat to see what's going on. Um, it's always fine to use that. Um, and I think that's all of the general breakout room introduction stuff. Uh, so today, the prompts we have, we have three discussion prompts, which are, what was your path to this program? Why are you here today? Um, how did you get into working openly? What, what made you interested in working openly? Um, and how has working openly affected your leadership? If you don't have an answer to that last one and you're like, well, I'm about to start, so I don't know, that's legit too. That's an absolutely fine answer. Um, so we'll post the prompts into the chat as well, just as a reminder, so you can see them. But they are right now lines 108 to 110, if you wish to see those. Emmy, how are the breakout rooms looking? Oh, good to go. Just noting that there's most rooms with three people and one room with four. So um, there's 10 minutes in total. Divide your time. Amazing. Um, is everything clear, folks? Can I have some thumbs up if yes? OK, we look good. Emmy, send them away. Rooms open. I would love to, and I heard that the recording just came back on, so it's perfect timing. Um, but yeah, I've always really enjoyed the um, the like sort of the, the global aspect of OLS, like meeting and being on the same call and being in the same community with folks from all around the world. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I'm mentioning that also because I, I, there could be a use for that in, in my presentation. Can you see my screen? Perfect. All right, I'm um, going to talk a little bit about Open Canvas, which is, um, I'm going to stop saying that it's my favorite part of this because last time I did that, you also said you cannot have that many favorite parts of OLS, but it is, I would say, a very useful part of OLS that I, I really um, uh, have taken to apply in my own work. So uh, I hope that would be useful for you too. Um, so just going back to uh, what we're going to talk about, um, open Canvas, of course, but the Open Canvas helps you think through an open project strategy. So um, we're going to dive into that a little bit later. Um, and we're also going to see one example, I believe. And at the end of this call, um, so for this week, one of your assignments would be to create an Open Canvas for your own project. Um, going back to the open leadership framework that uh, from Mozilla that Yo has introduced, um, this. Open Canvas fit into that by introducing a way for you to 
as an open leader to design and build projects that empower others to collaborate within inclusive communities. So here we're really focusing on that design aspect, how to, how to intentionally um, open up your work um, and facilitate those contributors um, uh, to you know, jump in and uh, contribute. So yeah, this table, um, again, hi highlighting here that um, we're talking about design specifically for understanding, sharing and participation from your community. Um, and uh, the framework is, the, the Open Canvas is, is a framework that you could use to, to do that. So hyped you all up about the Open Canvas. <laughs> what does it look like? Um, essentially, um, if you're, if some of you may be familiar with something called the Lean Canvas, it's quite commonly used in sort of tech product building and um, and software, I believe, and also business. Uh, there's the business Lean Canvas as well. So um, this is an adapted version of, of that canvas, um, but there is a major difference. Uh, hang on, skipping over to the major difference <laughs> is that um, in an open project we believe that um, your community or how you build it is as important as planning how you build the actual product or your project. Um, so as I walk you through you will see uh, you know this how this works is a way for you to plan for community contributions and really make them an integral part of growing your project and um, building your solution. So let me just walk you through um, these squares on the screen one by one. So uh, again, the top here, you will, for the next couple of slides, you will always see this open canvas um, and that will be in blue highlighted the different um, rectangles that you, uh, that I'm talking about. So you can kind of follow it. Um, but let me know if you have any questions as well or I, I'm not making sense anymore. So uh, on the top left of the open canvas, um, we ask you to think about the problem that your project is trying to solve. So let's give you an example, for example, open life science, right? Um, the problem that we're trying to solve is perhaps like, oh, uh, open science is, you know, is complicated, is um, complex, and it, it has a lot of, you know, different uh, even legal elements and, and um, quantitative elements and, and various things that, you know, it's not easy to, for, anyone to understand. Um, and so the problem is that with this amount of information, there's a need for people to uh, have a way to digest it and have a, have a guided um, framework and method to try and practice open science in their own work. So that's the problem that OLS as a product is trying to solve, one of them at least. You can highlight uh, sort of one, two, three if your, your um, project is solving multiple problems or intended to solve multiple problems. And then we move on to the solution. Um, so with that problem in mind, um, what, are, what is your sort of idea for addressing this problem? Or each of the, you can have a solution for each of the problems that you propose. Then um, key metrics. This is an interesting one. Um, how do you know if your solution has worked? Um, and this, I think, I feel like this question never gets asked enough, but it's, it's really, really quite important um, uh, in the sense that, you know, a lot of times we think about, um, you know, we, we're, we're, ta we're tackling some very difficult problems here, like in, in the world, right? Like sometimes, you know, some, some of you may be working on climate change, some of you may be working on, you know, really like groundbreaking research and, and or like, you know, training programs to change mindsets of people. All of these things, you know, may not be addressed by your solution alone. And you, it, I will safely say the same for OLS, for example. But it's important that we learn that we, our solution, are pushing things in the right direction, right? So these having, thinking about how you would measure that success for your project helps you um, know that you are heading in the right direction, um, and to help you understand what else you could do to um, move your project and the, the issue that you're trying to solve forward. Then um, bottom left, resources required. What would you need to be able to build what we call a minimum viable product? Um, so for example, for open life science, we need a Zoom account so that everyone can jump onto a call. 
Um, we also need facilitators to help, help us run the call. Um, and these things could be uh, anything from having experts and people to um, having hardware um, or even just, you know, money, because it's important. And then moving on to the right, um, again, this part is the part where we think about uh, planning for our community um, and their engagement. So um, thinking about who can, or who you would love to contribute to your project to make it successful. Um, so for Open Life Science, uh, as Yo mentioned in her talk, you know, you're all contributors is you are helping build this cohort and you are help, you're contributing your knowledge whenever you are in those group discussions and, and reflecting on what you've learned and sharing your experience with others. But we, of course, we also have um, mentors um, who, you know, have been wonderful people and wonderful supporters of, of you, of us and of OLS. Um, and, you know, what, 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 your, what we all look like is hopefully that we're all sort of open-minded people, open to learning new things, to um, learning from diverse perspectives. And so these are th some of the attributes for our contributors for open life science that we, we would put down, for example, in our open canvas. So um, this combined with the uh, resources required, then uh, the, these two aspects concerns with the project execution, the successful execution of the project, they're needed in order for the project to be successfully executed and, um, and uh, pursued. And then um, thinking about the other side of contributors, and I say that with a big caveat, actually, um, you'll see why later. Uh, yeah, thinking about user profiles as well. So who are the target audience of what you're trying to build? Who will be the early adopters, for example? Who are we serving with this project? Um, so the big caveat is that, for example, for Open Life Science, you see that the contributors are often or in many cases, the same as people who use um, the, the project. So y'all, for example, are our target users in many ways um, that you will learn from the, from the program and you will be able to practice open science through the, the things that you've picked up in the program, um, but you're also contributors, right? So what I'm trying to say is um, have a think about, you know, who are you building this for, but also don't be, wor don't be worried that they have to just be distinct from the contributor. In, in fact, it's probably a very good thing. Um, that they are overlapping. And I'm gonna talk about the next two together. So talking about channels of reaching your contributors and your users. Um, yeah, how do, you, how do people come into your project? How do they become aware of it? So for example, we've just asked you to discuss how you know about OLS and how you come to be here. Um, and that gives us insight into these actually, but you may have heard via Twitter, you may have um, talked to one of our organizers or one of our past um, cohort members. And, and these are all you know, ways that we get to expand our community and build out our project and grow it. So think about that for your own project. You know, if you're building software, it could be like, um, you'll have a website for your software and um, that way people can search and find out about your, your product. So together, these con con constitutes the community engagement part of the, the work, we would say. Um, it's how you reach out and engage your community in, in your project. Um, and I skipped ahead to say that contributors are actually a subset of users, as you can see here. <laughs> OK, last but not least, unique value proposition. Um, a bit of an interesting one, um, special, is to think about sort of uh, a clear message around what you're offering and why you are different. You may have heard a similar term in the context of a unique selling point. Um, we're not selling anything here, so, uh, but the, the idea is similar. It's, you know, letting people who are interested, be it users or contributors, know um, why, you know, they should invest time and why they should spend um, effort uh, and contribute to your project. Um, um, oh, I can go into a whole other talk about, you know, the reason why you should mention why you're different, but having, having a clear message around, you know, what you offer. So for OLS, for example, um, I mentioned the uh, global aspect of OLS, you know, we, we take pride in that. And we think that that does make our community different to other communities um, around the world, even um, that you get to meet um, 
folks, like-minded folks from all around the world will network with them as part of our program. So um, think a little bit about that. Um, it's, there's no definitive answers here and you will often find this changing as your project grow and you have different users and contributors who give you feedback and let you know what that special element actually is. So that's the open canvas. Um, I'm not gonna go into this example actually, but you can read it in your own time. I think the, the slides are in the, um, the notepad uh, and you can have a go at building one for yourself. I've seen this, uh, sorry, this is a link, which is not very visually, it's not visible. <laughs> we'll make sure that you have the access to the link to um, a template for your open canvas so that you could copy and um, make your own copy of the, of the template and then edit it so it becomes your own. Um, we also encourage you to share this with your with your mentor. But yeah, uh, in my experience, just to um, uh, round off, uh, this works really well as a framework for you to start thinking about, you know, your contributors and your and your products. But also, uh, you know, when if you need more support from, let's say, your boss on the project or people that you know, don't have much time and you want to quick over, give a quick overview of what you're working on, this is a really good one slider, one pager to present. Um, and you can walk through that quite quickly as well. So that's my two cents. Um, thank you. And uh, I see Gemma has a hand, I believe. And if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the etherpad or in the Zoom chat. Gemma, do you want to unmute? Thank you, Amy. Uh, maybe perhaps you can leave the canvas so that because maybe I don't say the names right. Um, um, hang on. Like the image. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's great. So I've used these uh, other types of canvas before. So I have two questions um, based on what you explained. So um, because you, I, I think I never thought of these resources versus contributor that should match for the project execution. I think that's a great um, way of phrasing it. If, for example, our project requires um, money, let's say, or something, you know, not so much as only development or design, is like funders or potential funders a contributor profile or all this is something that should go somewhere else, not in this canvas? Like Thank you for, yeah, sorry. I, sorry. Thank you so much for that. I, I love your perspective on it. And I think funders, I, I've never, not really been a funder, so funders here can speak for themselves. But um, but I think funders do appreciate thinking that they have contributed to your project, right? It's not like a, the relationship. I mean, sometimes the relationship is like, you know, I give you money and you go off and do whatever. But um, I do think, you know, having that conscious thought around oh, how would they engage? How can we engage funders in our work? Even, you know, one of the main things that we want from them is money. Um, how do we, yeah, make sure that, you know, they like thinking about what they want and what they need um, is, is really valuable for the project and they will likely get you more funders as well. Um, Yo has a hand. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this is just a reflection since I used to work at the Wellcome Trust um, and that I think Emmy is absolutely right in terms of people appreciate um, being being named and, and in fact usually you, if you get a grant you, you have to name people um, but there's also at least from the Wellcome Trust very often there was a legal obligation for them not to actually have an active hand in grants um, which may like is, is, is a nuance I guess but that's just to say whilst you can you can thank people for it there may be scenarios where people literally say no it's a conflict of interest and I can't have a more active hand beyond giving you the money uh, just to be aware of I guess mm -hmm. okay thank you but you would maybe consider them as a contributor profile okay thank you thanks for that do you have a second question by the way <laughs> I do, but it's more um, broad. Um, I'm always confused between the key metrics and the impact. But sometimes they are used the same, sometimes they are used um, differently. So key metrics is really things that you're measuring. It's not the impact that you're causing farther down the line, I understand. Yeah, that's, that's, a, very, that's a very interesting point that you've raised there. Um, 
I guess, again, I can only speak from my own experience. There are various ways where you can, like other frameworks that you can use to think about your impact as well. One of them you might have heard, it's called the theory of change. I don't think we, in this program, we don't go into it in, in a lot of depth. But um, I guess, the, the, as you said, the, the differentiator between, like the main thing about key metrics here is having sort of ways to be able to sort of monitor or measure your progress, right? So. Um, it doesn't have to be quantitative. It's one thing that I want to say. Could also be, you know, qualitative, good conversations, feedback. Um, but um, thinking about linking that to impact is is a very interesting one. <laughs> and in fact, I guess that going with the sort of theory, thinking about theories of change, which you know have this um, uh, the framework around thinking about medium, short, medium, and long term impact um, is, is quite, I would be interested to see, you know, others experience um, in sort of linking that and seeing how key metrics fit into measuring your sort of impact on different time scales. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> if anyone has anything to sort of share. Uh, uh, Ismail, um, okay, yeah, go ahead. I think just to rephrase what you were saying, Amy, it's behavior based impact. So, you know, reverse engineering what kind of change you want to see in the world. And in order to make that, what resources do you need? And in order to measure that, what should you be looking into? So, you don't need to reinvent what you need to measure. You need to just look at the work that you're doing that is actually making evidence for the behavior that you're impacting. Um, we would have a little bit of discussion on what personas and pathways and interaction um, where Anilda actually will come and talk a bit about theory of change that Amy was just talking about. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I just wanna also, I saw that Ismail made a very good point about when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Um, that's such an important thing to remember. <laughs> um, I, I also recently heard something that I will now forever try to bore in my brain, which is that measures are only as good as giving you an indication that you might wanna look further into things. It shouldn't, doesn't really perform functions much beyond sort of seeing, giving you the alert and be like, hey, maybe you want to pay attention to this area of your work, but it doesn't really indicate like how you should do it. It doesn't indicate, you know, if, if actually there is something wrong, right? Like that's, that's my latest revelation that has been shown to me about metrics. <laughs> so I thought I would share that. <laughs> Paper stages, definitely. All right, folks, um, in the interest of time, if you have any further questions about Open Campus, please feel free to drop them to Slack as well, where the, the whole community, um, all of us are happy to share our thoughts and answer them. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we're going to go into another breakout room. Let me stop sharing this. <laughs> Not helpful. Um, so um, in this breakout room of 10 minutes, is it five minutes or 10 minutes? Sorry, just clarifying. Um, we can do 10 minutes. Yeah. We can do 10 minutes. Yeah, I felt like it was a bit short. Sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, so 10 minutes. Um, we'll put two of you in the same room and we would like you to share your project's mission or vision. Um, so you can um, Add your, add your vision or mission. If you're, especially if you're in the written room, you can um, add your mission and vision to the uh, etherpad directly um, and then comment on each other's or like ask questions about it um, to help each other clarify um, what that is. Um, but yeah, we really want to hear sort of your big ideas and visions and dreams that you'd like to achieve behind your project and also behind you being NOLS, um, working openly and experimenting uh, with various things within your project. So um, if you're in the spoken room, of course, you can also share that in the written form and then refle reflect on it verbally as well. I think that that tends to work pretty well. Um, did I miss anything? 
Yo, are we good with the breakouts? We are fabulous. We have um, written folks. I'm sorry, there's only three of you, so I can't shuffle you around. Everyone else, I've tried to shuffle you a bit so that you have a different partner in your breakout room this time. Shall I launch? Yes, please. Amazing. Off okay. your go. See you in 10. All right, recording to the cloud. Welcome back. And um, yeah, I hope the uh, discussion was insightful and you've had a chance to share your uh, visions and missions and big dreams and aspirations, which is always lovely. Um, is there anything, I'm looking at the time, um, which is still fine. Um, anything that jumps out that anyone would like to share in sort of uh, briefly, I suppose. Feel free to unmute. Um, Sarah and I had an interesting mini conversation about uh, how I I'd have felt um, that I'm a bit too deep in, in the open universe. I almost feel like I need to learn also about barriers to entry or incentives outside of the open universe. And Sarah was talking about how she's coming from the opposite end, from an industry. And so this is in many ways like an immersion into to open as well and open, open practices and ways of doing. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, um, I feel like we've, and George has this really interesting point, definitely. Um, what, yeah, this is also something that we, I, I really enjoy seeing in our lesson is reflecting on our own um, journey so open and sort of where we are. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't feel like, you know, this never ends for me. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's only every single time you learn something new and you realize what you thought was open before, or well, what I thought was open before was not actually open, which is, you know, not quite a hot take, but <laughs> but then, um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for that reflection. Um, all right, uh, Malvika, you want to talk about some road mapping? Yes, um, my screen is here. I should have thought about it before. But I'll be talking about road mapping for open projects. So this is an introduction to a, an idea that you will be revisiting in the coming weeks as well. Um, therefore, please start thinking about it with this uh, road mapping idea, but you don't have to complete it just so you know. So road mapping for open projects, uh, we want to make sure that people, and when I say people, this is mostly you in the future, have a chance and understanding of how to discover your uh, roadmap to plan your work for contribution on your open project. We're gonna look for some examples and identify some of the examples that actually align with the project that we are doing and maybe you know reuse them. So an idea of open is also not to start building everything from the scratch, they have already existed all around the world. So probably look for things that already exist and reuse it wherever you can. At the end, we'll also ask you for an assignment. But again, assignment is a beginning of a work. We don't expect you to finish it, but uh, just thinking about it is already a work towards the assignment. So we have highlighted design, empower, and collaboration uh, for this particular idea of road mapping. So when you create a roadmap, you're designing, you're uh, integrating some of the ideas of how you're empowering people through the clarity through in your roadmap um, and where they can collaborate with you within your inclusive community. So the part of framework that we are looking at is designing for participation and inclusion. Um, how people interact with your project and what your project's identity is. So this is also a place to start thinking about how you're creating welcoming space into your project. So what is the good first impression for your project would look like? How would people know which is the right place for them to start working with you? You should also provide enough information about how they can get involved and also let them know where they are. It also allows you to communicate where you are and what's happening next. So what goes into a roadmap? It provides a project summary and sort of some idea around how you're gonna welcome people, how 
you and others can get involved and what is the timeline. So some project could be short term, some project could be really long term. And where does your project fall into this timeline would be helpful for anybody getting involved in your project to know at what stage uh, they are participating. So the first part of project summary and welcome. Uh, this part orient visitors to your project. It is important for them to understand where they are. Uh, you've already talked about vision and we will also talk about mission statement in the future, which is something that you would put here. What is your vision about the project? Why do you think people should get involved? Um, and what is the summary of the project? What do you aim to achieve from this project? Where do you need help from others? Where do you um, have resources available for people? So some of these information should exist in as short information as possible so people can identify the exact information as quickly. Second part is how to get involved. How, mi how might new contributors jump in right away. So now you're talking to each other in the breakout rooms and you're finding these connections. How would you think they would like to contribute to your project? So identify uh, those inf information or those points or parts of the project that is uh, that immediately requires some help or that could be useful for people to see. This is also a place to document, uh, to link any document that they should check uh, we will talk about code of conduct contribution guideline in the future. We would also talk about different sort of documents that you would be developing in your project. A lot of time documentation sounds like a lot of work and it is a lot of work. However, it is also a process for you to get some of your implicit knowledge out there. It is also a process for you to understand your own project. So roadmap is as much for others as it is for you um, in order to identify where you wanna go. And then finally, timeline. This is the star of the roadmap. Uh, some of the projects that I work on is only three months long, some are six months long, and then OLS, we don't know how long it is. So we really need to identify where we were, where we are right now, and where we, where we are going. Uh, if you already know that, that there is a beginning, middle, and end, identify those and describe those in a, some sort of organized tasks. So what would happen when someone joins in? What kind of tasks you are involved in that they can help you with? And these tasks could seem very trivial, but if you can put them in perspective of how does it allow people to achieve certain milestone? So how does the collection of tasks work towards a milestone? Also let people understand how they are part of something bigger than the, that just single task. And ma'am, what you are working on right now and what's going on next. Often I struggle to get people working alone in a project to put GitHub online or put their project online because they think that we are the only one working on it. Why do I need to communicate? And often their list of tasks look like that they are talking to themselves. I mean, when I say they, it's, it's me who's talking to myself. But often every now and then I would have a contributor and all these conversations that I have been having with myself is actually helpful for them. So even if you are the only person working in the project, if you can have this habit of documenting your milestone, it's really helpful for you six months down the line or anyone else who's joining you later in the project. So what is milestones? So milestones are really big things that you wanna do in the project. Uh, they are goals. For example, it could be a feature release if you're building a software or minimum viable product, if you're prototyping some of your ideas, it could be collection of events or dates uh, that you are working towards or time frame. So just looking at the events, it is a big milestone. Within the events, you would have multiple tasks. You might be able to do a lot of them yourself, but it would be great if someone can help you with. So maybe those are the things you would list into your um, roadmap and milestone. Um, you don't need to write every single thing. Uh, but maybe just pick a few milestones that you feel is important for you as well as anybody who would enter into your project. And then task, we already talked about it's a list of tasks under each milestone. What needs to be done? What does success look like? What are the pointers to get started? And we will return to this, but the pointers could be what kind of help you're offering someone when they are coming to work with you. So not just about, I need this thing to be done, but if, what are the support that is available for them if they would like to work with you. Often a lot of people who would come and contribute to your project would not have same information or knowledge as you. So also put some thoughts around, um, 
you know, what, what kind of training can I offer them? What kind of uh, opportunities I can offer them? Or if you have funding, can you offer them money uh, for their time? So also when describing milestones, tell them why it's important. How does it contribute to your vision? Uh, so again, putting the small task into a bigger picture of why you're doing this work after all. So how to store the roadmap? You can create a different, different file, which could be something like roadmap.markdownmd. If you're working on GitHub, it could be a readme file. We'll talk about this in the next cohort. It could be an issue on GitHub. It could be a shared notes that you're working with uh, in, in your project. Um, or it could be different idea that we haven't thought about. So one thing that I would really like you to think about is that a lot of things that we teach may come from a perspective which might not apply to your project. So maybe you're being more creative and you know where else your roadmap should be. Often you would see roadmaps in the landing page of whatever platform you're using. It could be a website um, or maybe you're, you have a video on YouTube where you're describing different milestones. So that's about it. Um, there is again an assignment linked in the Etherpad. However, that's a beginning of a huge work that you will be doing in the next weeks. Do we have any question? We are very much in time, luckily today. If we don't have any question, I would pass it to you for the closing and assignments. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, it's been lovely to be with you the last hour and a half, folks. Um, so hopefully by now you are on the OLS5 mailing list. If you have not received mails like this, first check your spam. If it's not in spam, please speak to us. Um, you should be on the OLS5 Slack, hopefully, if you want to be. That is not mandatory, but we do do things like reminders just before calls come up, and it's a nice way to chat with your cohort members, members as well. Um, we have been sending a bunch of micro-grants for participation. This is things like headsets, webcams, uh, covering internet out. Um, if you still need something, you can still ask for it. Uh, just let us know. The main goal is that we want to make sure that everyone is able to participate in the course. Um, to do that, email team at openlifeside.org is probably the easiest thing to do, or message us on Slack. Um, and fun bit, line 241, what should we name our cohort? So, previous cohorts, OLS1 was Open Seeds, OLS2, the pandemic had started, the it was now called Masked Cohort, OLS3, Perseverance persevere through the pandemic, but also there was a cool robot up in Mars. OLS4 was Kinez. Um, this is a rune for openness. Um, so there is a poll on line 242 where you can vote for existing names or you can share your suggestions of your own. Um, and I am so freaking inspired when I look at that. We have options, aspiration, resilience, peace for all and hope. And you'll definitely give me hope when I read all of these names. So thank you so much. Um, but if you haven't voted or suggested, now is a great time. Um, and at the end of next cohort, we will announce the winner um, and we will name our cohort. So there are also a few assignments, which Malvika mentioned. Line 245, you can see those. Um, I'm not gonna go through those in detail, have a look. Do what you can. If you can't, don't stress too much. It's okay to you know, turn up to a mental call and say, I'm exhausted. The baby was puking last night and I didn't do that assignment. Don't worry. Um, but if you can do them because it does help. Um, next call, we have another cohort call next week. Um, that's now normally we do alternating, but because we had the welcome call twice, um, that's the reason we have one straight away next week. If you can't make it, it will be online. We always make sure that the Monday after a cohort call, that it is online on YouTube and it has been transcribed. And that's thanks to our amazing call facilitators who are mostly people who've graduated from previous OLSs who take the time to upload it, check the transcriptions um, and generally make sure that it all looks all shiny. Um, I think that's just about it. If anyone has any questions, um, like we've talked about GitHub a little bit, we will go into that more in week five. 
Uh, so don't worry if you're like, what on earth were you talking about? We will get there. Um, sorry, there, I know some, we sometimes introduce a bunch of concepts. Um, if you want, on lines 270 downwards, there's a chance to leave us feedback about what works during the call, what we could improve. Um, and we always appreciate that if you have a minute or two. But I think, Emmy, Movika, anything to add? This may be a world record. We never finished two minutes early. Um, have a breather before your next meeting, if that is what's happening. And have a beautiful day. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Cool. So, so pointless. Why do we have? <laughs> no, take two minutes back. Lovely seeing you all. <laughs> Bye. See you later. Have a good day.